Welcome back to the podcast. This is the Chase the Summit Trail Talk podcast, and I'm your host, Dave. And if you haven't been here before, this podcast is kind of like you're just joining me for a run, and we're just kind of chatting, except I'm the only one talking because you don't have a microphone. Sorry about that. So in this episode today, we're going to cover some of the news this week, some of the big announcements that came up from Apple and my lack of podcasts last week. We'll talk about that. Some other news and of course my training and just what's going on with me right now, because I think that's why some of you tune in. And then at the end of this podcast, I will wrap it up with a big Q and A. Um, I, I reached out on Instagram and asked for your questions and you delivered that we've, we've got a lot of good questions to go through today. So with that, uh, let me just thank the Patreon members and YouTube members out there. I really appreciate your support. We've had a big influx on people joining the Patreon group, which has been really exciting. Um, if you don't know what that is, it's a way to, you know, su- support the podcast and support the YouTube channel in a very direct way you contribute a couple of bucks, it goes directly to me. And that means a lot to me. So if you want to help support what I'm doing here with the podcast and YouTube channel, uh, go check out the link at the bottom of the show notes down below. It's really easy to sign up for. And I do plan on doing more exclusive content on Patreon. I'm going to see if I can get some promo codes from brands and, you know, be only for Patreon members and try to drop some more little videos and clips and things there. But for now, it's really just a way to support me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for everybody who has been contributing. Uh, With that, I also want to give a shout out to the supporter of this podcast. That is Liquid IV. If you don't know what Liquid IV is, they make a product called the Hydration Multiplier. I actually use this stuff at my last 100 mile ultra marathon. I use it in everyday life if I'm feeling a little dehydrated or even after, uh, you know, I meet my friends at the bar for a drink. It's a great, (laughs) it's a great way to get out of a funk and feel a little bit more hydrated by using the hydration multiplier. It's a little packet of powder. You mix it in with your water. It tastes really good and it works. I mean, for me, um, it's just packed with electrolytes and it makes me feel a lot better. So if you're interested, check out the link in the show notes yet again and use discount discount code chase the summit, all one word at checkout. There's no spaces there. Chase the summit, all one word. And you can get 15% off your order by using that, which is pretty sweet. Final shout out for this intro. I promise I won't plug too many things in this podcast. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to the merch store. And if you're unaware, I've got a whole bunch of merch uh, in the merch store, including trucker hats, t-shirts, running shirts, all kinds of things, hoodies. Um, And for listeners of the podcast, I have a unique discount code that I don't advertise anywhere. It's just for podcast listeners. And that is listen 10. And by using that discount code, you will get 10% off your entire order at the merch store, which is, uh, it's a lot of fun. I do plan on getting more, um, products in the merch merch. I can't speak today in the merch store very soon. Um, I'm thinking like cold weather products because it feels appropriate right now as we kind of transition into the fall weather, which is kind of a bummer, but also kind of exciting. Um, but I'm working on more merch. So stay tuned in the near future for that. Okay, so quick life update on what's going on with me. If you've been following along the podcast, you might know that my family and I have been living with my my in-laws, my wife's parents, for the, the past few months because we're actually building a new house, which is very exciting, but also very stressful and very expensive. If you ask, if you were to ask me if I recommend doing it, I would say no. <laughs> it's like throwing a wrench in our everyday life. It's thrown a wrench in my training. Um, you know, I, I end up at a tile warehouse picking out tiles and bathtubs rather than going for a run most days. Uh, so it's be, really been a huge distraction on top of everything else we got going on. But the, there is light at the end of the tunnel. The house is almost done and I'm super excited to finally get in there. That's going to be really nice. But like I said, we are transitioning into the fall, um, which again does you know, I hate to admit it, but I do have a little bit of seasonal depression every year. This time of year when it starts to get darker earlier, it's colder out. I got to dig out all my my running tights and warm, you know, clothing because it's getting cold out up here in New England. We've we've had some mornings that are, you know, around 40 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is, it feels pretty chilly. It's not that cold, but it certainly feels chilly. Uh, so it has been a, a bit of a transition and, you know, I'm just trying to get used to it. I'm trying to get into that groove. 
Uh, typically every year I'm like clockwork where I, I start to feel that seasonal depression up front. And then it, it's like a couple of weeks of feeling kind of down. And then I come out the other side and try to look at the bright side. There is skiing coming. There's going to be ice climbing and, uh, you know, all that fun stuff. So it's not all bad. There is some good that comes with the winter, but it is certainly a transition to get through. And on the topic of training, uh, you know, I've had a few things going on. First of all, like last week I went for a run, uh, just a local trail, trail run casual. I think I was filming for some of the Apple stuff that happened last week, which we'll talk about in a minute. But I ended up with this like weird knee thing in my left knee, just adjacent to my kneecap, uh, to the left of it. That was this weird, I don't know, like a tight feeling where if I, my foot landed the wrong way, it would kind of zap me like an electrical shock kind of feeling, uh, scared the crap out of me. I thought I I was going to have like a running injury and I wouldn't be able to, uh, train or get out on the trails anymore. But fortunately that, that kind of resolved itself by taking a couple of days a little bit easier. Um, but it was a concern and still kind of a concern for me because I don't know if it's a hundred percent, I've still been running every day. Uh, but it is something I'm trying to keep my eye on. I've also been like dialing back my intensity a little bit just to be cautious about it. So it's something to keep out on, okay, keeping an eye on it. I don't know what's going on there. If you, if there's any doctors out there and you can make sense of the gibberish I just explained there, I would appreciate it. Hit me up on Instagram and let me know uh, what's going on with my knee. So let's pivot now and jump into the big topic that happened last week and why there was no podcast last, last week, I apologize for that. All the Apple announcements, if you're unaware, Apple launched a new uh, Apple Watch SE Series 8 and the brand new Apple Watch Ultra, which I'm sure you've heard of by now, especially if you've been listening to this podcast. And I was lucky enough to be one of the early testers. Apple reached out to me. Um, a couple of months ago, I had a call with them and they, uh, gave me an Apple watch ultra early to, to test out. I was kind of shocked because, you know, relatively speaking, my YouTube channel isn't massive. I mean, it's like closing in on 80,000 subscribers, which is not nothing, but you know, I'm not, I'm certainly not, uh, MKBHD or any of those giant YouTubers with like millions of subscribers. And typically I feel like that's where Apple, you know, targets where they usually send, uh, you know, products for testing and stuff. So it was a real privilege for me to be involved in this. And, um, I will say, you know, I can't give, I can't say all the things they told me and all the information they gave me, but what a, what a nice company to deal with, you know, being in this position and on YouTube, you, you often, you know, talk back and forth with brands and, uh, do all, all sorts of, you know, emails and phone calls and stuff. And, sometimes you get a feeling from a brand that they're kind of shady or they're hiding something. Um, with Apple, they were just really nice people. They, you know, I talked with a couple of their PR people and generally just really honest, nice people. And they wanted really honest feedback. You know, as I tested the device, we had a couple of check-in phone calls and they wanted to get a vibe for what I thought of it. And they wanted me to be totally transparent and honest. And I was, and even in my review, if you watched it on YouTube, I tried to be as honest and unbiased and objective as possible. I do share my opinion, of course, that's kind of my shtick, but, um, yeah, I, it was really, uh, a, a good interaction with the brand as a whole and a really exciting product. So if you're unaware, the Apple watch ultra is a new, uh, Apple watch, obviously from Apple that is specifically marketed towards that outdoor adventurer and endurance athlete or a climber or a surfer or diver, somebody who is really going to the extremes with their wearable tech. It's a larger watch, comes in at a 49 millimeter uh, case size, and it's built like a tank. It's got a sapphire glass lens. It's got a titanium case on it. And I've been wearing it for a few weeks. I got it on my wrist right now. And man, has this watch been somewhat of a roller coaster? So, you know, when I got it, being mainly, my history being mainly a Garmin user, a Koros user, and occasionally a Sunto or a Polar or something, I have a kind of a, I guess I would call it a bias towards sports watches because I'm so used to them. And there's certain things that I expect from my wearable 
to give me like, you know, my, my estimated VO2 max or my training load, my sleep and recovery, uh, advice, you know, my HRV stat status or my training readiness and all these things that kind of just give you feedback throughout the day on what's going on with you. How are you, you know, how, how are, how's your body reacting to your training, etc. And when I first started using the Apple watch, I was kind of banging my head against the wall because just like, you know, I have an Apple watch series seven and I had similar feelings towards that. But with the ultra, what bothered me about it is it's the same as a series seven or series eight in that it doesn't give you any feedback. It's just not designed like that. So for like the past couple of weeks, I've kind of been banging my head against the wall, trying to figure out how to make this thing work for me. When ultimately I got some suggestions from some of my viewers and some of my Instagram followers and people have said, Hey, check out this app or that app. So I started kind of going down a rabbit hole of all these different apps. And I landed on one called athletic and athletic. It's a A T H L Y T I C um, spelled a little differently, kind of like analytic, but with athletic in there, they kind of do a similar thing to what Garmin does with their metrics with like body battery and HRV status and all that stuff, but they do it on an Apple watch and on an iPhone. And what's cool about it in what I've been enjoying about it is that you don't have to use an Apple watch. You could use your Garmin Phoenix seven or Coros pace two or a polar watch. And as long as those platforms sync to Apple health on your iPhone, it'll funnel into this app as well. So that kind of opened some doors for some opportunity where if you are someone like me who does enjoy the Apple watch experience as a day-to-day device, when you're, you know, just living your life, you're going to work and stuff and you enjoy the, the ability to have cellular on board and all of the perks that come with Apple watch. But maybe you are somebody who wants to run an ultra marathon on the weekend. That's a hundred miles long and the battery won't last. Um, this app kind of allows you to do both and sync both platforms to the same thing, which is kind of cool and kind of unique, but, uh, I kind of digress. So check out that app. If you're interested, I'll try to remember to put it in the show notes. Anyways, the Apple watch ultra in a, in a nutshell is really just a regular Apple watch series eight on steroids. It's in a bigger, more robust case with a Sapphire lens and it's got more battery life. And it's also got a few extra sensors on it, but you know, at its core, it's still just an Apple watch, which is good, but also bad in some ways, like I just explained. And it's not just the wellness aspect of it, but it's also like the mapping and navigation aspect of it. And that's why actually today, this morning, I posted a video on YouTube, uh, about two apps. Athletic is one of them I just talked about, but I also talked about an app called work outdoors which allows you to do some mapping and offline navigation, which kind of bridges the gap between like something like a Garmin and an Apple watch. So with a couple of apps, you can kind of get most of the way there. Um, But yeah, that's, I'm kind of all over the place in this podcast. I hope you're following along. Anyways, um, the Apple watch was a big deal. The Apple watch ultra was a big deal for me and for the YouTube channel uh, because you know, I'm, I'm not just chasing views. I'm really excited about the Apple watch ultra, but also it's been kind of like the highest performing month ever I've ever seen on YouTube, like over a million views in the past 30 days, which is bonkers and kind of intimidating to think that many people are looking at my stupid face. So <laughs> that's kind of where I'm at now. Um, but yeah, the Apple watch ultra is a very exciting product. Unfortunately, that was the only product they sent me for early testing. I will be getting the new series eight and the new um, Apple Watch SE, I'll get be getting both of those to do some comparisons and um, kind of an initial review on those. So stay tuned for that. But I also got a couple of other new things. I got the new iPhone 14 Pro. Apple did not send me that. Uh, but I've been actually really enjoying this, particularly for the camera, because the iPhone 14 Pro, if you haven't been following along, they added a new mode to the camera called Action Mode. And it honestly kind of turns your iPhone into a GoPro. It gives it like incredible stabilization. And I've been finding that for a lot of my, I do a lot of like funky, you know, I'm I'm on YouTube. So I'm, (laughs) I'm filming my shoes. I'm filming my watch. And in some situations, you know, I don't have my GoPro on me. Maybe I just want to go for a run and leave my stuff behind. 
Um, so it's pretty cool that if I have my phone on me, I can still get the shot now with that new action mode. There's some downsides, like you, you're limited to 2.8K resolution, um, up to 60p, can't do 4K, which whatever, you know, most people are watching my videos on their phone anyway, so they'll probably never notice. Um, and it doesn't have like the new horizon leveling or anything else. It's really just an en enhanced stabilization, but I'll take it, man. I'm, I've been pretty happy with that, but it's pretty cool that the, um, the iPhone 14 got that. And it also got that new satellite communication thing where you can call for help, even if you don't have cell phone service, pretty cool stuff that they're doing over there at Apple. And it's going to be interesting to see kind of how the, how the competition adapts in both like the phone realm with the Apple iPhone 14 pro, like if Samsung is going to start doing that satellite communication thing. And then also with the Apple watch ultra, I feel like even though it's so different than a Garmin, it's still a competitor, right? And just it existing is going to push the whole market, the whole, all of these companies, you know, all these companies already had board meetings, boardroom meetings about the Apple Watch Ultra because Apple sells way more devices than any other brand. And if they do something like this, where they're directly targeting a market like, you know, adventure sports and endurance sports that Garmin kind of owns, I'm sure Garmin took notice and they're probably, you know, yelling at their engineers to develop something even cooler. So this is, I mean, you know, that thing existing, the Apple Watch Ultra is just going to push everybody and the consumer is going to win because everybody has to, you know, move faster and do, do more exciting things. So hopefully with that, we see maybe Garmin finally introduces cellular into their watches. Um, you know, there's the 945 LTE, but it's not really a cellular watch. It's just for safety reasons. You know, you can do, you can call for help and you can share your location, but it's not really a full blown phone on your wrist, like a, like an Apple Watch is. But you know, time will tell. We're going to see where the market goes after this. On top of the Apple Watch Ultra, we also got the new AirPods Pro 2, and I was lucky enough to get those early for testing, and I do have a video on YouTube about this. And I tell you what, I personally have never really been an AirPods for, fan because um, I, I don't like, I still don't like the look of them. I don't like that they're white. I don't like that they have a stem. I'm personally a more discreet earbud kind of person, like a Jaybird Vista or a, even the Galaxy Buds or something like that. I like them to be small, dark, and in my ear, so they're not very like flashy. But I will say the Apple AirPods Pro second gen, they've been a real pleasure. There's some features on there. I've been really enjoying like the new um, adapti adaptive transparency mode. It allows you to hear what's going on around you, but if, a, if something really loud occurs, it'll turn down the volume on that. And the best example I've found with these is when I go on a road run, and somebody drives by with like loud exhaust, like a big, you know, tractor trailer truck or something, the, the earbuds will turn down the volume of that truck, but still allow me to hear what's going on around me. This is kind of game changing. Uh, and I, you know, again, I don't know if this is going to push the market in a new way, but it's really impressive stuff. It's almost like a hybrid of noise cancellation and transparency mode kind of merged into one. And on top of that, they just sound really good. Like they're really high quality earbuds that I do not mind wearing and they're super comfortable. There's a lot of pros. So I've actually been wearing them a lot more than I thought I would. And, uh, yeah, you know, big fan. Um, I, I still wish I could buy them in black. <laughs> still can't do that. Maybe someday, but yeah, they're, they're really nice earbuds. So I, I would check those out if you're in the market and don't mind white earbuds. So the Apple news, uh, kind of took over my life <laughs> for the past week. I think I put out five videos in five days and, um, it was a lot of work. So that's why I did not get a podcast out last week. Apologies for that. If you're a avid chase the summit trail talk podcast listener, <laughs> I don't know if there's anyone avid out there, but if you are, I appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to try to get back on a regular cadence and also, one thing I've been struggling with is I don't want my YouTube channel just to become Apple news, right? There's other YouTube channels for that, like Mac rumors and ins inside Apple and all them. But I feel like I, I want to cover more about the Apple watch Ultra because there's so many questions in my mind and more tests I want to do. So I'm going to continue to post stuff about it, but I'm going to try not to let it just overtake the entire YouTube channel. Um, so, you know, 
I guess I'm looking for feedback. Am I doing too much? Is it going to turn into an Apple channel? Let me know by shooting me an Instagram message or uh, hitting the contact form in the show notes down below. Um, but it, I mean, I feel like I, I owe it to people to, to do the testing because I had it early and I, it's such an unknown and a new device for Apple that I feel like I need to do it. So I'm going to do it. Dang it. Okay. Moving into some of the other news that happened during the time I didn't do a podcast. Uh, the first thing is, uh, Elliot Kipchoge set a new world record at the Berlin marathon he shaved 30 seconds off his own time, and he ran it in 201.09. Holy moly. How fast is that? That's a very, it's like a four minute, that's like a 430 pace or something ridiculous. That guy's an absolute beast. Um, I've been, I actually listened to a podcast the other day from uh, Some Work All, All Play podcast. It's David, David Roach's podcast with his wife, and they kind of dissected his training plan it was really interesting because I, I really didn't look too much into what he does, but apparently he focuses a lot of his training in zone one or like a lower heart rate. And he also runs about 125 miles a week, which is a lot of running. I mean, that, that's a lot of mileage, but you also hear runners like Jim Walmsley and some of the ultra runners out there that do like 200 miles a week. So it's probably not the most insane amount, but you know, maybe he knows that sweet spot of, doing just the right amount. So he does a lot of zone one training. It got me thinking about my own training and how I could apply some of his, you know, training principles in my own training. Um, yeah, I'm not going to dive too deep into that, but I suggest going to it, going and checking out that podcast, some work all play. Um, they really dissect it and talk about it for like an hour. And I, I enjoyed listening to it during my run the other day. So pretty cool. Uh, another piece of news from the week is a new device from Garmin, the Garmin InReach Messenger. Uh, Garmin let me know about this ahead of time, but they didn't send me one for testing, unfortunately. But I do have one in the mail now, so I should be getting it like tomorrow. And then I'll be doing um, my review probably next week if I had to guess. So the InReach Messenger, it's weird uh, to me because it's almost like it's replacing the Garmin InReach Mini. If you don't know what an, what an InReach is, by the way, it's a satellite communicator. So if you're off the grid, you're on a boat, you're in the middle of nowhere and you don't have a cellular, a cell phone signal, you can still text people from your InReach because it communicates directly with a satellite rather than a cell phone tower. Um, it's really cool tech. I've had a Garmin InReach Mini and Mini 2 forever. They're great devices, great uh, emergency devices to have in your backpack. But this new one is almost like it's an InReach Mini, but they kind of stripped out the big screen on the front and instead put a big battery in it. So the InReach Messenger from Garmin has way longer battery life of up to 28 days of tracking, I believe. And it can also reverse charge your phone. And the idea behind this is in the event that you're in the middle of nowhere and you need to send a text message, you can plug your phone into the the messenger and then you can reverse charge your, your phone for 20 minutes to make, to, you know, to make a call or send a text. The device itself is also a satellite communicator. You don't need to pair your phone with it. If you do pair your phone with it, you get to use a, a new app from Garmin called Garmin Messenger that basically the idea behind it is it will trans, it will transfer your commu communication between whatever is available. So if you have a cell phone signal, Garmin, Garmin Messenger will allow you to use your cellular or Wi-Fi connection to send messages. And as soon as you lose that, it'll seamlessly transition you over to the InReach Iridium satellite network. So there's no downtime. So if you have a cell phone signal, you can still text through there. And if you don't, you can still text through there using the SATCOM connection from the Messenger device uh, over a Bluetooth connection. And then the device itself, the Messenger, has a couple of buttons on it where you can still send pre-configured me messages right from the device without using your phone. The messenger also has a SOS button. So if you're in a pinch, you get in trouble, just like the um, InReach Mini 2, you open up a little door on the side and hold down a button and your SOS signal will go out. That works worldwide, anywhere in the world. And if you push that button, uh, they will dispatch a helicopter and get people looking for you. So 
don't take it lightly. <laughs> but like, you know, just like the InReach Mini 2, it's a really solid thing to have in your backpack and a nice insurance policy. For me, I like to have my Mini 2 on me whenever I go to the mountains in case my wife really needs to get a hold of me or know where I am. Or, you know, if she doesn't hear from me, she can track me. And if I do get in trouble, I can tell her, you know, I'm okay, but I'm in trouble or something like that. Um, so the mini two is something I take anytime I go into rem remote areas. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to test out this new messenger device because, because it does have longer battery life and it does seem like it's, I don't know, a little simpler than the inReach mini two. So, um, stay tuned for the review on that. The next piece of fitness tech news I want to talk about this week is a new device from Aura Ring. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of what the Aura Ring is. It's a little ring you put on your finger. It's got sensors in it to pick up your HRV and heart rate and sleep and all that fun stuff. Uh, however, Aura just put out a new a new ring. It's a new old ring though. So it's called the Aura Ring 3, Gen 3 Horizon. The Gen 3 Aura Ring is the latest and greatest from them. Uh, the, the, the Gen 3 Horizon is the new version of that. And the only difference is that they found a way to make the ring round all the way around. <laughs> so on the Aura Ring Gen 3, there was actually a flat spot on the front of the ring that housed the battery of the device. Um, so they had to have a little flat spot. Honestly, I didn't mind it. It made the ring look kind of unique. Uh, but this new Horizon model gets rid of the, the flat spot. Apparently, they found a way to package the battery in a way that doesn't require that flat spot anymore. So the ring is just perfectly round. And you can get it in rose gold, silver, uh, stealth black, and gray. So pretty cool. Although it's the same exact tech as before. So nothing super exciting there. But at least... At least they found a way to get rid of that flat spot. So if that really bugged you, this may now be an option. Okay, now let's move into the Q&A for the week. I've been talking for 30 minutes already and I haven't even got to the Q&A yet. So this might be a longer episode than usual. Uh, so if you don't know what the Q&A section is here, it's questions and answers. Basically, every time I do a podcast, I put out an Instagram story and I ask my followers on Instagram, what do they want to know? You know ask me anything. I'll answer it on the podcast and then they can submit questions. I screenshot it. I write them all down and then I read them live here and I try to answer them in real time without putting too much thought into it. Shooting from the hip. So with that, if you want to sub submit a question, uh, go to, go to Instagram, chase the summit on Instagram, send me a DM or hit the contact button in the show notes down below or on the website. And you can send questions through there too and be featured in the next episode. Otherwise, Keep an eye out for the story where I ask ask for your input, and uh, we'll go from there. So the first question I have from today is from Alan Forrest. He says, I know you're super busy. You're a dad, you're a YouTuber, and you have a day job. If you could take one week off from everything, what would you do? Wow, that is a great question. And I've been thinking about that a lot, a lot lately because I've been so freaking busy. Um, if I could take a week off, I would go to the mountains uh, with minimal Wi-Fi connectivity. I say that now, but I'd probably be like, man, I should make a video while I'm here. <laughs> Cause I do, I do like making videos. I guess that's a, it's a funny question because if I could take a week off from my real job, I would probably just like go full on YouTube and make a bunch of videos about various things. Cause I do enjoy doing that. Um, if I, if I took a week off from doing anything, including YouTube, I guess I would probably, go to the mountains and do some trail running and some camping and try to enjoy myself. The next question I have is from Orly Liba. Um, they ask, how do you prevent chafe? <laughs> That's a good question. So I, you know, I feel like I'm not very prone to chafe. I feel like I have friends that like always chafe no matter what. And I just don't have that kind of luck. Maybe I'm lucky. Maybe I'm not. I don't really know. But for me, what works is knowing the clothing I'm wearing for long endeavors, like if it's an ultra marathon, I, I'll need to know the shirt and shorts and socks and everything I'm wearing will not cause me problems. And they've been tested before on myself. And second, I do, I really like the product body glide. I know a lot of people use squirrels, nut butter or like other products for me, body glides worked great and it's available everywhere. Like I can go to my local running store, buy it or REI or whatever. Uh, and it works for me. So I, I really like body glide and I, 
I'm pretty liberal with it. You know, like armpits, crotch, shoes, like feet, anywhere where something could potentially rub, I pretty, I put a good layer on there. And that pretty much solves the problem. Even at my last hundred miler, it was hot and sweaty. I didn't really chafe. I, I had a little bit from my vest, my hydration vest on my back, but it wasn't, wasn't bad at all. So that's the only advice I could give you. Unfortunately, it's not the same for everybody because we all have different bodies and shapes and clothing and yeah. So I hope that helps in some way. Uh, SM4G1 says, what's the number one best running watch on the market right now that someone could buy? That's an impossible question because what's right for me may not be right for you. Um, I guess if like money isn't zero of an object, I would say the Garmin Phoenix 7X or the Garmin Tactic 7 or the Epix Gen 2, like any of those high end thousand dollar plus Garmin's are pretty awesome, but they're also big and heavy. So maybe that wouldn't be the right for one for you. If weight is a consideration, um, I would say one of the best values and most feature packed on the market. Well, there's two of them at 200, 200 bucks. The Coros Pace 2 is still an amazing value. And then for under 400 bucks, I really like the Garmin 400 255. It's a solid watch for 350 bucks. It's got like almost everything that a Garmin Phoenix has, except for like full blown mapping. You know, I, I think that's kind of a go-to recommendation for me. Next question comes from Doug Moore 51. He asks, what running gear needs the greatest evolution in 2023? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think, man, what's, what's a piece of gear that's not, hasn't been really moving much. I would say maybe the hydration vest. <laughs> like when's the last time we saw a big innovation in hydration vests? Well, there's companies out there like Orange Mud or whatever doing like the back, the bottles on the back or the weird waist belts and stuff. But really, I feel like there could be some more potential there. I, I It's definitely not GPS watches because those have been moving so fast. We've been getting crazy long battery life and tons of features and OLED displays. So those are moving in the right direction. And I think shoes are pretty incredible too. Like we're getting trail shoes now with carbon plates in them, super light, durable, responsive, fast. Um, yeah, I, I guess I would say hydration vests. And then second to that, I would say shorts. <laughs> it's a weird subject topic, but how often, like, I don't get this in 2022, Every time I try on a pair of running shorts, the pocket on the back or the side is not big enough for a phone. It's 2022. Everyone has a big phone. Put a big pocket somewhere. I've got a couple of pairs from like REI and a pair from Hoka um, that have big enough pockets, but it's just not common and it needs to be more common. So I would say that hydration, hydration packs and shorts, weird objects, but I feel like they're the ones that haven't really, you know, advanced quickly. I think, I think that makes sense. Okay. My kids just got home from the bus stop and they're screaming in the background. I apologize if you can hear that. <laughs> I just had to pause the podcast to go, uh, shut the door, but you can probably still hear them. Okay. Next question comes from Carlos Scrod. Best way to recover from an injury without total rest. That's a great question. First of all, I'm not a coach. I don't, I don't really give advice on how to train and stuff. But all I can say is what works for me. I typically, if I like get a really bad injury, I will take time off, um, like full, full blown time off. And especially if it's a pretty serious one, I'll take a lot of time off. But what I find works best is to cross train. Like if you're capable of riding an indoor bike or an outdoor bike, or even going for a hike, um, lower intensity, lower impact and dialing back your, you know, the slamming motion on your knees and joints. Typically that's what works for me. Uh, sitting completely still is something that does not work for me and usually ends up mentally and physically hurting me. So I wouldn't suggest that. Um, again, I'm not suggesting anything. I'm not a coach or a doctor. Take this with a grain of salt, but yeah, that, I think that's what works for me. Hopefully that helps. Torbjorn, HB, are you disappointed with the new Apple Watch battery life, uh, Apple Watch Ultra battery life? Yes and no. Like I said, it's been kind of a roller coaster with me with my experience with the Apple Watch. I really like it for day-to-day -day life. The fact that it's literally a phone is amazing. 
I can go on a 5K run after work, leave my iPhone behind, and still be able to stream from Spotify or Apple Podcasts, Apple Music, text my wife that I'm going to be a little late or maybe, uh, you know, she needs me and I need to get back quickly. I can still get messages there. It's amazing. It's like super cool that I have that capability for my wrist. But again, once, once I transition into the mode of being like a Garmin user and having like two weeks of battery life and never have to worry about it, the fact that I do have to worry about it now is annoying. Like if I ran yesterday and then I want to go for a run today, I, I have to be aware and look at the battery life before I start my run because right now I'm at 51% and that should be fine for a couple of hours. But if I wanted to do a longer run, that may be, be a problem. So it's, you know, it's just something to be aware of. I don't think I'm disappointed. I wouldn't use that word. I think I, I expected it. I didn't think we'd have a Apple watch that would get two weeks on a charge. It just doesn't seem realistic. And I do think we, we will see further development of it once, you know, Apple put this out there and they're, they're looking for feedback. They're going to soak up all that feedback and develop new former updates and maybe low power modes, power optimization settings. And I feel like they're going to dial this thing in to the point where maybe it will start to compete with the Garmin's and Coros's out there, but we're not there yet. Disappointed? No. Uh, you know, annoyed occasionally? Yes. I'll leave it like that. Next question comes from Danny Goy. How do you find time to be a dad and still run the amount you do? What's your daily schedule like? Oh man. <laughs> it's funny how many time management questions I get in these questions. Um, it's really hard. And I've said it before. I don't manage it well. I really just kind of fly by the seat of my pants. So I basically tell myself I want to run every day and to accomplish that, and get my real job done and get YouTube stuff done and be a dad sometimes means it's either very early in the morning or it's very late at night. I've gone on runs last week. That was, it was almost midnight and I was out there with a headlamp on. So you got to do what you got to do. I mean, that's how I look at it. There's only so many hours in the day and I try to take advantage of them, but it is a balancing act because sometimes I do feel a little disconnected from the family like, man, I worked an eight hour day and then I went and filmed the Apple watch ultra video. And then I went for my run and then I get home and it's like 10 o'clock and my kids are in bed already. And I haven't seen them, seen them all, all day. Unfortunately, I do have days like that. I'm not perfect. Um, but I, I'm aware of them and it bothers me. So if that happens, I'll try to make up for it another day. You know, it kind of is what it is because the reality is, YouTube's kind of like a sec second job for me. Uh, I, I I enjoy doing it, but it does take a lot of work and I do have a real job. So it's kind of like this in between of, you know, I don't know how much time to dedicate on any certain thing. The answer to your question is I don't do any of it uh, successfully. I do everything pretty poorly, but I, I somehow get by. <laughs> Next question comes from Christos. Uh, he asks, any Sunto news? What happened to that rumor about the Sunto 9 Peak Pro? Great question. <laughs> if you were listening to the podcast like a month ago, I mentioned that there was a rumor about a new Sunto Peak 9 Pro that just never came to fruition. And unfortunately, I don't have any news about that. So to answer your question, no, I have no news. But uh, hopefully, I mean, I would expect them to do something now that we're approaching Techtober and we've got the holidays around the corner. They're probably going to do something. What they're going to do, your guess is as good as mine. Next question is from Ben Merid Meridian, I think is how you pronounce it. Do you think there will ever be some sort of AMOLED and solar combo on a watch um, or a Garmin? So here's a really tricky, I, I've seen this a lot. So a lot of comments, first of all, the comment quality on Apple Watch videos is all over the place. I had like Apple fans, Garmin fans, people who just didn't like me. There was a lot of hate comments in those videos. But in those comments, there were a lot of people who also were like, eh, I wish I had a solar panel on it, or I'm not interested until it gets solar. And I think the reality of the situation is solar technology has not hit a point yet where it's going to be um, efficient enough to provide a charge to a watch like an Apple watch that has a fast 
computer inside of it. It's got a really bright, vibrant display. It's taking a lot of juice to, to run that watch. And the tiny solar panel that can be fit on the front of a watch is so inefficient that the only watches it's going to work on are going to be Garmin's with kind of dull displays, like those MIP transflective displays. So to answer your question, I don't think it, we'll see it anytime soon. I think like with any technology, it starts big and chunky and inefficient and it gets better over time. So maybe five or 10 years from now, maybe less, we'll start to see something like that, but not in the immediate future. And if they do, I would question even how effective it will, if it will be, or if it'll just be some sort of marketing tactic. Next question is from David has Insta. Uh, he asks, do you think the Apple watch ultra pushes Garmin in a good way? Yep. I, I just mentioned this when I talked about the ultra earlier in this podcast, the, the, the very fact that that thing exists at all means that Garmin is going to have to do some serious innovation in drive, you know, a new product that will rival it forward because Apple's kind of creeping into their territory. So uh, yeah, a hundred percent. And not only is it going to be pushing Garmin, but it's going to push Koros and Polar and Sunto along the way because they're all in this game together. So, um, you know, they're all going to have to come up with a, a way to compete with that monster that is Apple. Next question comes from Bo Jing. I think I pronounced that right. How accurate or useful do you find the training metrics from your Garmin, like training load, rate, readiness, HRV, et cetera? I honestly think they're super valuable. Once you kind of learn the ins and outs of it, um, I, you know, I, I don't use it as a way to, I don't wake up and look at my training readiness and say, oh, my, my readiness is low. I'm not doing anything today. I really use it as a form of validation. So if I don't feel good or like I'm questioning whether or not I should run, if I feel run down, I'll take a look at it and be like, oh, my HRV is jacked and I'm, I, my numbers don't look good. Maybe I should take a rest day, but I don't let it make any decisions for me. So it is valuable in that way that it kind of validates how you feel, but I don't think you should necessarily read too far into it. It's also valuable in a, in uh, historical data. So I like the HRV graph because on Garmin Connect, you can look at your HRV over time for like the past several months and you can kind of see waves of, you know, when your HRV dropped and went up. And after my 100 mile ultra marathon recently, I, I watched my HRV tank for like a week and then it crept back up. And that was super valuable because it it showed me like when I could get back into training at a minimal risk of hurting myself. So in some ways it's valuable in others, not so much. Um, it's really up to your use case. If you can find value in it, then it's valuable. Next question comes from Ad Abdullah Fitz. He says, uh, Apple watch ultra or Phoenix seven. Hey, I got this question about 700 times in the past few days. Uh, I'll just boil it down to this. If you want a really good smartwatch experience and you don't run, 100 mile ultra marathons, get the Apple watch. If however, you do go camping and backpacking and run ultra marathons and uh, need longer battery life and want the training tools on board out of the box, get the Garmin Phoenix 7 because that's what it's designed for. It's, it's better in every way in that department, but the Apple watch ultra is a far more fun and useful everyday smartwatch while the Garmin Phoenix 7 is more of a training tool and like I would word it like that. It's a tool in less of a gadget where the Fien the Apple watch ultra is more of a gadget, even though it can be a tool. I hope that answers your question in some way. The next question comes from Rex, the Gorman. Uh, they say, if you had to buy just one sport watch and you didn't have a YouTube channel, what would it be? I'd be torn. Um, I've been really, <laughs> I've been really liking the Apple Watch Ultra, but I don't know if it could be my only device. So I would say I'd be torn between the Garmin 955 or the Epix Gen 2 because I like both of those a lot in their own ways. Next question comes from Noah B 85 He says, top three wants from the Apple Watch Ultra in the next version. Uh, battery life, battery life, and battery life. Just kidding. Um, one of those would definitely, one or two of those would be battery life. I would say battery life, built-in 
built in offline mapping, if they could some do something like build it into uh, Apple Maps, have an offline option for that, that would be cool. I'd be okay with that. And I would really like them to put in some integrated feedback for the wellness data. I know they like to rely on third party apps. And I've talked about this, made videos about this before, but it would be cool to see them. It could be part of Apple Health even. Just at the top, have a summary of your HRV, your estimated VO2 max, your seven day training load, just to like give the users something. Because out of the box, you're really left to your own devices to figure out what's going on in sifting through all the numbers and HRV. And if you don't know what any, any of that stuff means, you're not even going to look at it. And I think that's most users. So it'd be cool to see them integrate more feedback. Uh, that would be my three things. Mapping, navigation, offline mapping, and Apple Maps, uh, wellness feedback, and battery life. If they could, you know, battery life, I would take four days. Give me four days, I'd be happy. Two days is like, eh, I don't know, man. Like, I already charge my phone every night. I don't want to have to charge my watch, too. <laughs> and I like getting sleep data. So if I have to charge it at night when I'm sleeping, I'm not going to get the sleep data. That's annoying. Next question comes from Justin Jones. He asks, uh, how do you juggle training podcast, YouTube, and being a dad? I think I answered this question already. I don't do it successfully, <laughs> um, but I already, I already answered that question, so I'm going to move on. Thank you for the question, though. Uh, Jan Janication2602 says, have you ever bought a used watch? Do you have some tips for buying one? Yeah, I have. And before, you know, I was lucky enough to be uh, have the YouTube channel and get discounts and stuff. I had to buy everything. Obviously I still buy a lot of stuff now, but I, I have a, I can validate my purchases now. Um, but before, before that I have bought some used watches. I think the last time I did that was like a Garmin Phoenix five and I bought and sold a used watch. The thing to look, look out for in general is going to be battery degradation. That's the number one thing. Uh, but the number two thing would be to look out for the APAC model of garments. So if you don't know, there's regional models for garments. Here in the USA, we get one called the ROW, which means rest of world. And that means just about everywhere in the world. But if you're in Asia, you get an APAC model, which stands for Asia Pacific. Um, and there's no difference. Like functionally, you can use an APAC Garmin Phoenix 7 in the USA, and you can use a, a row model in Asia without a problem. The problem is APAC models get firmware updates after the row models. So if you're in the USA and a new and exciting feature comes out on the Garmin Phoenix 7, but you have an APAC model, you're not going to get that feature for like another month or two because they're behind on the, they have to go through another process to get the firmware out. So that, so that's really the only frustrating part of those models. Um, like I said, functionally, they're fine. Uh, the other downside to the to the APAC models is I don't believe they have a warranty in the USA. So if you get sold one new, uh, you know, be wary of that. And sometimes you do see this on like eBay or even on Amazon, you'll see a heavily discounted watch and it might turn out to be an AP APAC model, unfortunately. So just to keep an eye out for that, make sure to ask the buyer. They can always dive into the settings and see if it's APAC or not. Next question comes from I am Cy. Uh, can you review the free train hydro vest? I'll take a look at it. I do have, I actually have a couple of free train vests kicking around here somewhere. They are very interesting, but the ones I have are just a phone holder, which I thought was kind of weird. Like you're basically wearing this big vest to only hold your phone. Although it is very functional on how it holds the phone. It is kind of weird that you're wearing a lot of fabric just to hold the phone. Next question comes from uh, Pedro Fazerla. Ah, I can't even pronounce the, the name here, uh, but thank you for the question. Uh, what do you do professionally and what started your interest in smartwatches? That's a good question. So professionally, I work in mechanical engineering, um, which I think kind of led to my interest in what I do on YouTube as well. So it, I work for a warehouse robotics company. We basically automate uh, the picking and placing of boxes in various aspects of a warehouse uh, for big box stores. So what got me into the smartwatches? Uh, well, I got, I was really obsessed with them. I don't know why I, I got into hiking and then I bought a 
Garmin Phoenix one, the original, which I, I still have one and I made a video about it like months ago. Um, and I really enjoyed the watch, but I found shortcomings and I kind of did my own internal review of it. I even wrote it down, I think. And then from there, I started writing reviews in blog form on my website and getting some, you know, some traction traffic coming through there. Um, and then I, you know, bought a Garmin Phoenix seven and started making the videos that you see today or Garmin Phoenix six, uh, in the nine forty five, the original, and then started making the videos you see today. And I just really went down a rabbit hole of comparing and contrasting and, um, yeah, I don't know. I really don't know what got me into it, but I feel like I kind of have a mechanical mind, kind of an analytical mind from being in the engineering world that kind of applied itself to what I do on YouTube. I think that answers your question. Next question comes from Dana, uh, Janet Canation uh, as well. They just asked a question, but I have another one from them. Which watch do you recommend for someone uh, starting ultras? If you're on a budget, I would say check out the... Yeah, if you're on a budget, I would say check out the Coros Pace 2. That that watch just has so much value at 200 bucks, And it has 30-hour battery life in GPS mode, which should get you through just about every length of Ultra up to like 100K. Uh, you know, even 100 milers doable with that if you're on the in the middle of the pack on a flatter course. If you want to go longer than that, Coros has some, I really like Coros watches for ultras because they just work, they're reliable, and they have great battery life. Um, but if you've got a bigger budget, obviously I would recommend the Garmin Phoenix 7 or the 7X or the Enduro 2. They're hugely capable with great battery life. The mapping is awesome to have for ultras, um, but it really depends on your budget. Hopefully that helps. Next question comes from Ryan Colker. He asks, uh, all-time favorite running song? <laughs> Oh man, there's so many good ones. You know, I, I'm going to embarrass myself here, but I listen to like, like hardcore screamy music because <laughs> that's kind of what I used to listen to in high school. And, uh, I just never grew up and I still listen to it today. So I'm going to, I'm going to give a shout out to a band that I listen to now. That's going to totally embarrass me, but there's a band called avoid. The band is called avoid. And then the, the song that they write or made is called flashbang. <laughs> And it's just so like rhythmic in your face, like punch in your face. It makes me want to move and damn, do I love running to it. Uh, that's not like an old classic or anything, but that's kind of like what my go-to, if I want to run fast, if I want to do like a fast 5k, I pop that, that song on, put on my shoes and, and go for it because it's a lot of fun. And a follow-up question to that is from Saggy Berlin, which is interesting. They have a similar question. Uh, he says, what do you listen to while you run? Do you listen to podcasts or music? So like I said, for music, I listen to like loud, screamy, in your face, like hardcore music from bands you probably never, never heard of. Uh, I also like randomly, I'll listen to like techno or EDM t style music. Um, if I just want to get into a flow, uh, on the trails or on the road. And then finally, I love, I love podcasts. I have a lot of favorites. I'll name a few. So I like the sharp end podcast. It's a podcast about uh, climbing accidents, which is really interesting. Even if you're not a climber, the stories are just like really interesting. Um, they're usually about climbers falling or ice climbing or avalanches, skiing, things like that. Just a fascinating podcast. I also really like out alive. That's from outside magazine uh, where they have uh survival stories of people who've been like mauled by grizzly bears or accidents or camping or even climbing accidents. Uh, I also like the some work all play podcast. That's, uh, David Roche and his wife, and they talk about training and ultra running and running in general and fitness and stuff like that. And I also like some really, really weird podcasts like tiger belly, which is, uh, Bobby Lee, the comedian, he has a podcast. I don't know why I like it. It's such like toilet humor, but sometimes I just want to like turn my brain off and giggle and Tiger Belly is a great source for that. And on top of that, I also like Theo Vaughn's podcast. I forget the name of it, like something next door. I forget, but I listen to a lot of, uh, stand up, stand up comedian podcasts just because they're funny. And sometimes I just want to unplug and, and laugh while I'm running. Yeah. 
That's it. So that is the end of the questions. I really appreciate everyone running it, uh, writing in questions this week. Um, some good ones in there, some good little tidbits of information. I had a lot of fun with that. So like I said before, if you want to send in a question and be featured on the podcast, make sure to watch out on my Instagram stories. Follow me at Instagram at Chase the Summit and uh, follow along. Also, you can just send me questions. You can go ahead and click the contact me button in the show notes down below or over on my website at chasethesummit.com and just send me a question. You can also just DM me on Instagram. I'm pretty responsive there. And yeah, send over the questions because they're a lot of fun and we're going to keep this ball rolling. Seems like people like it. Uh, final thought here, I will be having a guest on, uh, hopefully n- next week. I'm trying to get my buddy, uh, my fellow YouTuber friend, which I'll, I'll leave, leave as a surprise to be on the podcast. We're just working out details and schedules and stuff. So stay tuned for that. And uh, yeah, I got to do my outro. Make sure to check out the show notes down below for all the sponsors of this podcast. Make sure to check out the website, chasethesummit.com and the merch store and use discount code LISTEN10 for 10% off your order over there. Make sure to follow me on Instagram and do all the things over there. What else am I missing? Oh yeah, follow me on YouTube and stay tuned because we're just entering the holiday season and holy moly, it's going to be busy. I've got a lot of top secret stuff going on over here. There's going to be a lot of YouTube videos and I need to get well rested to, uh, to keep up with all of it. And with that, I'm going to let you go. Now we've been on for almost an hour and that's kind of long for these podcasts. So I apologize. Thanks again for tuning in and I'll try to get back to a regular cadence on this podcast now that the craziness of Apple is over. So check out next week, tune in and listen, and I'll see you then. Bye.